quite an honor to be here on my first ever TED stage. <clears throat> the famous TED speeches. Um, you know, we're born with a natural curiosity. And we have an open mind. We want to learn things. We want to learn how to feel things and what they do to our senses when we're a tiny baby. We want to open cabinets eventually. And our parents let us learn these things. And every time we see something new move by or we touch it, we smile. And it's such a great thing. And then we go to school. And in school, oh, we want to open those cabinets. But you can't open the cabinets. 30 kids, 30 students can't open every cabinet. We're taught rules. Our behavior is regulated. Our desire to be openness and learn everything is inhibited. You can only learn what is in this class, the same thing on the same minutes and days as every other student in your class. And that's what school is. We're taught that intelligence is having the same correct answer that everyone else in the class has. And that's intelligence. And if you were to question, oh, when two can canoes meet on a river, the river wouldn't go at that speed. If you were to do that, you are disruptive. So your intelligence is only coming up with the same answers, and they aren't your answers. And this is what we call learning a lot of facts or methods, but not really learning to think for yourself and come up with your own ideas, which is the heart of innovation. Now, the role of technology is to create the great devices that make life better. In, in other words, I'm in my home and I have a washing machine and my great-grandparents had to wash clothes by hand. How awful that must have been. Oh, how unhappy they must have been. Now we have the easy life. We can turn on a television and watch movies and, and that's the role of technology. It will give us a lot more leisure time. It will make us happier. Okay, we don't necessarily smile more than people did a thousand years ago, right? But in theory we do. That's the reason we're creating this great technology. So technology has a purpose, and the purpose is to do good and to share. And it's very important that we're open when we have those ideas, that we have methodologies and ways to present them and bring them to the public. Now, I was told by my dad that if we created enough great devices and things in life to make life easier, Someday, we wouldn't have to work as hard. We'd have a four-day work week instead of a five-day work week in the States, perhaps. And wow, I thought that was a dream. Well, you know what? Over my lifetime, we've been totally successful at creating the most incredible technology that does so many things for human beings and saves so much work over the old days, you know, 10x, 20x, whatever x, 100x. And uh, we've been successful. We've created all these devices. We've created all this new wealth. But for some reason, now in Silicon Valley, it takes two people working full-time, stressful jobs just to own a home. So wherever that wealth that we created, that not zero-sum wealth, you know, technology is you invent a better way to make a chair. So human beings and society have that technology, those methods forever and ever and ever. It's not just built one time and replaced. So, you, so that's how you create new wealth. And wherever this wealth went, it didn't quite go to those of us working to create it. Um, the inhibitors of wealth are often, uh, I mean, of innovation, are often large companies that want to seal things up and say, we have a money machine. We're going to turn the crank. We're going to keep putting out the same sorts of products, and we'll artificially improve them. But if anybody comes along that might displace our business, might have some new technology, the wave of the future, innovation will assimilate them or will ignore them. Very often, market research doesn't turn up the value of these new devices that are coming. Like personal computers. The big computer company said, no, these little microprocessor-based machines are never going to do anything worthwhile. Well, they, they were only in touch. They were good marketers. They were just only in touch with the people that were using their big, expensive computers of the day, and they weren't in touch with nurses, and doctors, and engineers, and teachers, and students, and all the rest of the world that might want their own computer someday. We had a club, the Homebrew Computer Club. People in the club got up and spoke. I was too shy to ever raise my hand and speak. But I listened to academics, people from Stanford and Berkeley and places like that, and they would talk about how this technology revolution of chips that could finally do about as much as a computer, the, pro the heart of a computer, these chips were going to lead to a social revolution. The social revolution meant we were going to be able to communicate, type a message, and within an hour, 100 people dialing up on modems might read that message. 100 people was a large number in those days. Wow. 
and we were going to have better education because a kid could get corrected instantly on their answer, whether it was right or wrong. They didn't have to wait for the next school day. Their brains were going to be so well utilized in the future. And the little guy who knew technology, who knew how to program a computer to get solutions, was going to go into work, write his own programs that were so much better than the high-paid programmers on the million-dollar computers, and have a little machine on his desk actually doing the great work of the company. We little guys were going to be so important. That was the heart of my life. I wanted the little normal person, the person that understood and studied and used their brain to come up with solutions to be more important than the big, huge companies that basically controlled our life and controlled what we could and couldn't do, the ones that regulate us in a sense. And that was one of the reasons that I took my skills as a great technology developer I designed my first computer very quickly. I actually modified a terminal I built into a computer with a microprocessor. Now, before that, every computer, you had to be a computer expert to dare touch it. Front panels, switches and lights, ones and zeros. Nobody would touch it unless you were the computer operator that knew how to use it. Now, all of a sudden, the Apple I was like the first computer that was affordable. The price was right, and it was a complete, usable computer for running real programs. It had a keyboard like a normal typewriter, a human thing. And it had a little display on a TV with letters that came across. You could afford a TV. You couldn't afford a teletype machine with printed out. It costs as much as a car. So this was my contribution. I didn't design the computer necessarily for the world. I designed it for the other people in my computer club that wanted to do those great things with society and improve life for everyone. And I gave away my designs for free. No copyright notices, no nothing. Trust me, the Apple One computer is public domain. And everyone there, I was saying, build your own, build your own, build your own. Not enough of them span, were builders. You know, a lot of people love technology and want to use it, but there aren't that many of them in the club that were real builders. And so we had to start a company and make boards for them, and, and uh, the story goes on. Of course, Hewlett Packard, I pleaded with my company that I loved so much. Hewlett Packard, as an engineer, I was going to be an engineer for life there. And I pleaded with them to build this small little computer that looked like a typewriter, and they turned me down five times. So Steve and I had to start Apple. Now, the Apple II was really the great revolutionary machine. I designed it as a computer from the ground up. Nobody ever expected the features in it. It was leapfrogs. It was you looked at it and said, whoa, I never imagined a machine would ever be able to do these things. Even my engineer friends at Hewlett Packard said, this is the greatest product I've ever seen. And the Apple II was very, very open. The, in the Apple I, I'd given it away. That's as open as you can be. The Apple II had all sorts of expansion capabilities, the amount of memory, slots you could plug in, little pieces of hardware to do tasks that computers could do to monitor oil levels in the ground, if that's what it was, to have a floppy disk, to have more, more memory for a bigger spreadsheet, a screen. And the Apple II was as open as could be. We put out manuals with our schematics and circuits like TVs of the old days did. We put out all the code listings so you could learn how to program computers at different levels. This was really um, a totally open environment. Now, I maintain, yes, Steve and I had a little argument over that. He wanted to build the Apple II with two simple slots only. Tiny little machine, self-contained, never expandable, one slot for a printer, one slot for a modem. I said, oh my gosh, computer people love to do lots of things with computers. That wasn't my motivation. Motivation was I'd come up with a very clever technique to use two little chips to have eight slots work with an operating system where normally it would take so many, about 40 chips, five chips on each board and a whole bunch of thumb wheel switches on each board to select the addresses. Oh my gosh, I wanted my little two chips to be shown off as something great I'd done. It turns out that because of that, there were two other early personal computers, Radio Shack and Commodore, closed machines. If you bought it with 4K bytes of memory, that's all you had forever. If you bought it without a floppy disk, well, there were no floppy disks back then. There was no way to add one. So the first killer app that really made personal computers go, the Apple II wouldn't have gone probably even with the dreams we had for it initially. And then came the spreadsheet, VisiCalc, the first killer app. And this spreadsheet, a businessman could go in and, and, and write for more programs in half an hour than they could do on pencil and paper for the rest of their life, planning the financial scenarios of their companies. So the sales shot up high. Well, that spreadsheet, VisiCalc, could not be written on the other two little early machines from Commodore and, and Radio Shack because they didn't have enough memory. They weren't expandable. So the expansion built in, planning for the future, 
having the ability to expand and add more was really what made Apple basically take over the world in those days with the Apple II, even though it was a great computer. Now here's a company that got made one of the largest, biggest companies in America in the world back in those times, Apple II days, and got made with a product that cost nothing to build. Steve and I had invested a few hundred dollars each you know, and we and we come up with this machine out of nowhere. So Apple took a huge leap in time with the open Apple II. Now later on, we got kind of closed up in a lot of ways on products. Marketing took over, and marketing made us put chips in to disable features on some machines so people wouldn't think they were capable of doing what another machine we had could do. Um, and, and that was, you know, kind of disappointing to me. But when did we really, when did Apple really expand again as a company in terms of its value, its stock price and all that? If you go back and look, it was really with the iTunes and the iPod. Great machine, the iPod, no doubt. But then Apple only had about 6% of the world market share in computers running iTunes on Macintoshes. We could have plugged the iPod into a Macintosh. If we sold the iPod to only 5% of the people in the world, it wouldn't have made Apple twice as big as it was with computers alone. No, we wrote iTunes for Windows. We opened up. We were open in that sense. We let the iPod be used by everybody in the world, no matter which computer they were using. And then Apple took its big, huge leap, and today with all the iProducts that have followed onto the iPod, building in our music system, it's basically, you know, hey, if you want the music system today, we're closed up. If you want iTunes, you've got to buy an iPhone. We don't write iTunes for, um, for Android. We don't write it for Windows, and I think we should. We should treat every individual product of the company, including iTunes, as a valuable product on its own and market it to the world. Um, there's, it comes to the idea of ownership. What do you own in life? As a matter of fact, when you're in school in those early days and you get your first little beatings, my behavior is tightly controlled. It's controlled because other people own the schools. And before the time of personal computers, your big companies owned the computers and they set the rules for using those computers. They owned it. But you know what we were taught? When I was young, we were taught that freedom was, was the ultimate desire of all mankind. You know, even though the United States wasn't really started as a very free nation, if you really go but look at it. But freedom was what we were all about. And communism suppressed freedom. Why? Because people weren't allowed to own their own property. We own things that we had. You know, and, and my father taught me, you know, all about technology and he taught me about Things like radio signals, my gosh, those analog devices, you could, you could easily record it, figure out a way to record it someday onto recorders, television signals and the like. Any radio signal that penetrated came into your house, violating your space, belonged to you, and you could listen to all those frequencies. Well, until cell phones, and then we banned certain cell phone frequencies. It's like a core value of mine, you know, got so disrupted by this, we're going to close it up where we don't want you doing certain things. Now, as we've moved towards the digital age from the analog age, we've got all this open ability to program bits to do many more things than ever before, but we've also got the ability to encrypt them with encryption formulas. And now when you buy things, it's less like you own it. In the old days, you would buy a record, you owned it, you had the right to sell it, and now you very often with software and with media, you lease it and you agree to terms and you will not copy it and you will not pass it around to your family and you will not share it and it's like you don't own it anymore. You have licensed it. Obviously, we get to the cloud. You sign up for a lot of services on the cloud and you always click, okay, I agree to this, I agree to that, I agree to that, I agree to that, or you won't have your technology that makes your life fun and great. And we all have to agree to these things, but we don't read them. We don't write the contract, someone else writes the contract. Ah, oh, I have a long life. I have a lot of experiences where when I didn't have any say in writing a contract, very often things got taken away from me. So I know that every one of those contracts I've signed, every time I clicked OK, I've said, you own everything, you're guilty of nothing, I can't do anything goes wrong, it's my loss, and you're not to blame for anything. I just know that's how it's written. And I'm scared. And on the cloud has caused me problems already. I've had complete online calendars, like Google calendars, lost or change their name um, due to simple technology things, and I don't have a backup. I taught for eight years. I taught young kids in schools how to use computers for your schoolwork. But one thing I taught them was, if you get a phone call and your mother's in the hospital, what do you do? Back up your computer and get to the hospital. 
Back up, back up, back up. So I have some of the things that I put out into the cloud, I've actually pulled back for the time being until I can trust things fully, like I trust a bank with my money. I mean, that's a cloud for money. Um, until I can trust it, I want my little physical backups I can hold in my hand and I know where it is. This internet was, you know, supposed to be so beautiful, an open world. It was supposed to, you know, and in the early days it was. Anybody could communicate anything they wanted anywhere. Did we have an internet government? No. Did we have governments controlled at all in regulating it? No. It was wide open and it was beautiful and it was working well with almost no government at all. We're always told that leads to anarchy and now, Countries, like we grew, up in our, we grew up in society, our schools, our countries had borders. You couldn't come in or out. That's closed, that's not open. And our schools were like that. And you always learn in school, my school, right or wrong. Stop thinking, don't use your brain anymore. Just, it's your school, it's your country, that's what you've gotta be for. And you don't have to use your brain. I mean, society likes to dumb us down a lot and it really fights this whole thing about innovation. What is regulation about? You know, everybody fears regulation takes away freedom is a common thing that's said. I disagree entirely. In our country, the Bill of Rights specifies your freedoms of speech, your freedoms of religion, and this and that. And the way it specifies it is by saying, Congress shall not pass a law. That's regulation of Congress. You're regulating, governments will regulate the bad guys that are already regulating our lives. Now, it might be big cable, it might be big telephone that wants to regulate how we can use the internet, what we can connect to, what data we're gonna receive, how much we're gonna pay. They want, they're the ones who wanna regulate the individual thinkers, the real innovators. Government regulation of the regulators is very appropriate in a case like this. Um, the biggest touch in computers over my life, it's the relationship between a human and technology. We want to keep the human more important for now. Sure, maybe technology is already the master and we don't know it. And maybe someday it'll be so much smarter than us, it'll become the master. But for now, we want to think we humans are the ones that are most important. How do you make the human most important? You design the technology to work in very familiar human ways and obey human paradigms. Okay, technology has gotten more and more like a human. Our first computers ah, 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 spoke like computer talk. You couldn't understand it. And the speech got nice and, and full and fluid like a real human being's talking to you. And graphics became movements on the screen like cartoons, and now they become like real movies and things look natural. That's all a more human world. The computer is becoming a human. Someday, the senses that I have, the sense of touch, sight, hearing, um, someday smell, motion, it's all built into these things, human senses, and I can speak to it, and I can get answers sometimes. It's not good yet, but this is the path we're on, and this is the path we've got to continue to follow. I, want, I consider it an open world when I don't have to think of a certain procedure I'm supposed to follow on a machine, touching it in the right places to get something done. I just want to speak the thought on my head, I want to get an answer, I don't even want to get links to articles that might give me the answer. And we're getting there, the more these machines get smart like human brains. Who do you ask questions of now? Not a person, but starts with G-O and it's not God. Thanks very much.